Good morning, everyone. I invite you to come on in and grab a seat. We're looking forward to our time of worship together this morning. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 12. I would like to read Isaiah chapter 12. Just before we get there, I um, just want to let you know that uh, Nick and Cher had a little baby boy yesterday morning early. So apparently mom and baby are doing well. Not sure about Nick, but mom and, and baby are doing well. And I think uh, Judah Brooks is the name. Um, seven pounds, eight ounces, 20 and a half inches long, 432 yesterday morning. So everyone's health, healthy and we're thanking the Lord uh, with them for uh, that, gift, that gift of life. So Isaiah chapter 12, if you would stand, let's, uh, let me read this and... Uh, we'll pray and we'll begin our time of worship together. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted, sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth, shout and sing for joy. O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Let's pray together. Father, it is with thankful hearts that we have gathered together this morning. We are mindful of the reality that we were once your enemies. We once loved to live life our own way and to go our own way without any reference for you. But you in your mercy and in your grace pursued us and saved us. And you did that through your son Jesus, whom you sent to the cross, whom shed his blood so that our sin could be atoned for and we could be restored to a right relationship with you. We're thankful that you have given us a new heart. You've placed your spirit within us and we have gathered together today because we want to bless your name we want to worship you we want to lift high the name of Jesus and father we're here thankful we're also here dependent upon you and today in a special way we are we are mindful of the need to be equipped by you to represent you well here in this world and so I pray that in everything that is said and done today that you would be honored you would be worshiped in spirit and in truth but father we would be built up and equipped so that we could serve as your ambassadors in faithful ways help us I pray be honored in our midst I I pray this morning in Jesus name amen let's worship the Lord together
to start with our armor verse. It's 1 Timothy 6.9. It's on the front of your bulletin. It's on the big screen. Or you can turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, recite it with me, please. 1 Timothy 6.9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires, that plunge people into ruin and destruction. 1 Timothy 6, 9. And that is an, called an armor verse because we want to use God's word as an armor against the attacks of the enemy of our soul. We also um, want to uh, pray for and encourage you to pray for uh, our missionary spotlight for today. Uh, and that is <coughs> Dima and Siveta Mudru. <coughs> excuse me, uh, in Romania. Um, there's a lot going on there. They're still dealing with, uh, and will probably be dealing with for quite some time, refugees coming over from Ukraine, plus their own uh, ministries going on uh, in Romania as well. So we want to continue to pray for them. And um, there'll be four uh, people from Grace Hill that'll be going to Romania uh, end of October, uh, early November, to uh, work with the ministry there. Um, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we count it a great privilege to be able to come to you. Well, it, at least it is a great privilege whether we consider it as such 
or we take it for granted or that, that I do sometimes. But here we can come to the creator of the universe, the sovereign of all, and we have your ear. That, that is enough boggles the mind. You are so worthy. You are so glorious. You are so holy and so righteous that we just want to declare it and we want to shout it. Is he worthy? Yes, he is worthy. And I worship you, almighty God. It is true. You are holy, holy, holy. It, it, it's amazing that with all of those, you still desire to have us come before you with our petitions, with our pleas, with our begging. And so we start by thanking you for baby Eamon, for little Judah. We, we thank you uh, for that new life, even as the news of the last couple weeks is about people destroying life. We thank you for that life. We thank you that uh, it seems mommy and daddy are doing well we ask that you would strengthen them. Their family is now different forever. And so is our church. We have got Sunday school teachers and elders and deacons who now have another image bearer of you to disciple, to minister to, to love. And the parents are going to need help. New parents don't really have never done it before. So help us enable us to come alongside of them and encourage them and strengthen them and share the wisdom that maybe you gave us as we were struggling when we were first parents. Father, we thank you uh, for the Mitru uh, family and their ministry in Romania. We ask that you would protect them from all kinds of stuff that's going on over there. We ask that you would bless their ministry, that it would not only grow your kingdom in numbers, but in maturity. We think of the Suko family, uh, who are going back and forth over the border into Ukraine, um, parts of their neighborhoods, the cities that they ministered in are gone, wiped from the face of your earth. We ask that you would give them strength. We thank you um, that they seem to be being upheld by your right arm and sitting here with nothing really to worry about in Merton, Wisconsin, that seems amazing. But you are an amazing God. We pray for those in our congregation who have some illnesses. We pray for those that are have planned medical procedures in the next uh, coming days and weeks. We ask that you would uh, that you would be merciful. We ask that you would grant healing and restoration. Um, but even more than that, we ask that you would enable those to endure with patience um, and resting in you and not being anxious. We thank you for. Andy and his family, we ask that you would watch over his family as he is away, as they, uh, uh, a mom with a couple kids, they've got uh, difficult, uh, a single parent is difficult, even if it's just for a couple weeks. So we ask that you would watch over them and give uh, Andy safe travel, and that you would um, bless his ministry for the glory of your kingdom. We ask that you would enable us to live what we claim we believe. Father, enable us to have a stronger faith and to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've called us and to walk in a manner worthy of our Lord. When they see us, God, we want them to go, man, your God must really be worthy if you're willing to dedicate your whole life to him. We want it not to point to us, but to point to you. We ask all these things 
for the sake of your great kingdom and the glory of your great name. Amen. Please stand with us.
So this morning, the scripture reading, I will be reading from Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 28. Um, as you are turning there, I'd like to just uh, just say a brief word of introduction of our speaker, Andy Giesman. Uh, many, many moons ago, I think when I was still in junior high, my family and I went out to visit my older brother, Aaron, at Baptist Bible College in Pennsylvania, which is now not called by that name. Um, and we went to a choir rehearsal, and he had befriended two old guys. Andy was one of those old guys. Um, unlike many of us who went to college to, the, to find a wife, Andy had already gotten married and went back to college, went back to school. I don't I think he kind of quit going to school since. Um, but uh, we were privileged to have him here. Um, he has uh, done many things over his, his life, and uh, I've learned much from him. And uh, I'm excited to hear him speak today. Um, after, I'm sure he would love to talk to you by his table and talk to you more about the organization that he, he works with. But let's, let's read chapter um, Acts 17, verses 22 through 28. So Paul, standing in, the midst of the, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an, an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in, hemp in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the, all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far off from one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Andy, thanks. Is he here with you? Can you hear me okay? I feel like I'm not. Um, I am now. All right, so it is great to be able to be with you, and thank you, Andrew, for introducing me as an old man. Um, that's nice, <laughs> uh, but it's kind of true, and it's also true I was going to school back then, and, and I have not stopped. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts 17, if you are not there, where we're going to be um, looking at uh, some of these things today. You can go back. Yep, right there, great. So, um... Basically, I'm a missionary to college students in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I have an organization called Addison's Walk Institute for Christian Studies. I don't have time to explain to you where that name comes from or, or what we're all about, but uh, I basically created my own missions agency eight years ago to be involved specifically with the students and schools in Scranton. And there is a method behind that madness, why, why we did that. But I would like you to know that we are supported like missionaries. Um, so as you consider um, helping spread the gospel uh, with our mission there in Scranton, if you would like to ask me about that, um, I'd love to talk to you about how you could be a part of that. And I do have a display in the back where I will be hawking my wares after, after uh, the service. So as soon as I'm done, I'm going to walk out there so I don't get waylaid and, and, don't, and don't get out there. And we have just a few t-shirts and books and things that are nominally priced and all that. All those proceeds go to help our ministry. All right, we're going to be in Acts chapter 17. And um, if you were in Sunday school, I mentioned that there are two classic university texts in the Bible. And uh, uh, yes, I did make that up. Uh, I went to seminary and I took a class, a graduate level class on sermon stretching, and I aced it. So I can do things like identify the, the classic university passages. The first one is Daniel 1 in the first half of chapter 2, and the second is in Acts chapter 17. 
I, I would love to stand here and just kind of explain to you the heart of our ministry, what we're doing, what we have done, and what we think God is asking us to do in the future, but I don't want to jip you of preaching from God's Word. So me teaching from Acts 17, this is my stump speech. I love teaching Acts 17. I don't know how God feels about us having favorite passages of Scripture. You've ever thought about that? Like, you know, that whole all scriptures God breathed thing? So I, I don't know. Um, but if, if it's okay, this is probably one of mine. Um, because this really speaks to the heart of what I'm doing. So you'll, you'll kind of get an idea and perhaps get a little bit different view into the, the ministry and life of Paul. Now, when I was a kid and um, I started driving, I got my learner's permit, got my license soon after I had a classic car. It was a metallic brown, sparkly 1984 Plymouth Horizon. Yes, friends, that was a glorious piece of American machinery. And if any of you have ever seen the Plymouth Horizon or its cousin, the Omni, you would know that the steering wheel is about this big. You could get your head stuck in it. I don't know why they made them so big. And that car was a four-speed stick. So my very first car was a four-speed stick. And my mother was scared to death because that's a lot for a new driver. You're trying to figure out the road and you're rowing through the gears and all that kind of stuff. Um, and one of the things that my dad taught me, besides driving, when we were sitting down to go out driving together, he said, now, Andy, one of the things you're going to need to know about cars is there's going to come a day with maybe even this car, because it was a, um, you know, a POJ, uh, that was a other, its other name, that's a piece of junk. <clears throat> he said, so it's either going to be this car or some car in your not-too-distant future, you're going to come out and put the key in the ignition and in my new bougie car, I don't put the key in the ignition, Dad. I just press the button. But he's still right that you're going to try to ignite that engine from either a button or an actual old school key, and nothing's going to happen. He said, so when that is the case, do not panic, because all you need to do is stop and think about there's probably one of three reasons that that's not happening. An internal combustion engine needs three simple things in order to burn, and you know what they are. It needs an ignition source, fuel, and air. It needs those three things. If I take away any of those three things, will the engine run? No, it may splutter a little bit, um, depending on which one I take away. But if I take away any of those three things, the engine's not going to run. So each of those three things are necessary for the engine to run, right? Yes? Are any of those three things sufficient by themselves to make the engine run? No, they're not. I should tell you, if you weren't in Sunday school, you're like, wow, you've really thought about your car. That's because I'm an adjunct philosophy professor. So, hashtag philosopher probs. These are the things that I think about. So, no, none of them are sufficient all by themselves. Me standing before you, actually standing upright... Uh, being able to speak, um, communicate with you. There's a lot of necessary systems that are working together right now, but not one of them by themselves is sufficient for me to communicate to you. And if one of any of those systems decides to do its own thing, like if my endocrine system or my skeletal system right now decides, you know what, I'm going on sabbatical, I don't want to be part of this anymore, I'm going to fall over. It's not going to work, but neither of those systems by themselves can communicate to you. So there are some things that go together. Paul recognized, I think, in Acts 17, as he's on a layover on his way to Corinth in the ancient Greek city of Athens, that there are three necessary causes that are going to work together for him to have gospel ministry in that city. These same three things that worked there are things that we can apply in our gospel ministry in the 21st century and things that I can apply in my particular ministry in the college classroom. Now, um, before we go any further, let me talk about uh, a couple things up here. And there's no going back, right? Can you go back for me one? Um, one thing I did want to mention to you, I'm working on a blog series where I'm investigating um, kind of the roots of how we got to where we are. So I'm reading a bunch of old, dead, angry German guys. 
And uh, I, I put a blog series together called Heroes of the Rebellion, God, Angst, and Urgency, How Existentialism Shaped Our World. So for those of you that were in Sunday school, um, I'm reading and trying to analyze a lot of Friedrich Nietzsche and stuff like that. So there, there are ways that you can find my blog on the table. If you want to just ask me about that, just let me know, and um, we can talk about it. Now, Acts 17, um, beginning in verse... Beginning in verse 16 and following is a preacher's dream because there's three really uh, preachable sections. We like that. That's nice. And there's no holy number about it has to be three points. But for timing and all that kind of st stuff, it really works out. Is it not? It says it's on. What needs to happen? think so. Okay, I'll just use this then. Just use that one. All right, and I'll shout. All right, so I'm going to turn this one off, or is it working now? No? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so here's, this is just a little hot though, guys. If you can turn this down a little bit, please. So here's the thing um, with these three sections. The, the latter two, the second two-thirds, if you've spent any time, church, Sunday school, youth group, anything like that, are going to seem kind of familiar to you. I'm going to spend the majority of my time in the first third of this passage because there is some really amazing pieces to understand this ministry that Paul has in Acts 17, and again, to give you a little bit of insight into what I do. And frankly, there are some words in there that a good number of times we as North American Christians, uh, we have been conditioned to skip over. Because if we read names of old ideas or people in the Bible, surely things that we can't pronounce, we may not spend a lot of time working on those things. And we're, many of us are conditioned um, over years, as, as we read stuff like this, we're like, this is just information. I need to get to the section that's going to tell me what I need to fill in the blank. Do, right? Because we've become very pragmatic. We have to have the practical application. What are we supposed to do? Well, I'm here to tell you, you don't always need it. Because just knowing things is actually a good. That's a good thing. Um, and the the more that you know, the more that you can do, they actually go together. So we're going to spend um, the majority of our time in the first third as we walk through this, and then we're going to really slap it into B for Boogie, and we're going to move through the second two, last two-thirds, second two-thirds. I don't know. I didn't study math in Bible college. So that's what we're going to do as we uh, move along. So the first thing we're going to look at is understanding. So this is the first of those necessary causes that's going to work together towards a sufficient cause, and, and I want you to think through um, what it is that Paul understood. So going up to uh, verse 16, let's start there, and I'm going to read through verse 18, and here's what Luke writes. <clears throat> While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, and the them he's waiting for are Silas and Timothy. These are the them he's waiting for. Paul's on one of his missionary journeys, and he's on his way from Berea, down, he's heading down towards Corinth, all right? So Corinth is a, a major port city. Athens, by the time Paul gets there in the first century AD, is already an ancient city. The glory, or you may have heard of this somewhere in school, the golden age of Greece is over. That is long over. That is ancient history by the time Paul gets to Athens. Athens is still a major center of learning and culture, but as far as it being the flower <coughs> of, the, of the Greek islands, that's gone. And it, like everything else, has been subsumed into the Roman Empire. This is where he is. Paul's waiting for them in Athens. He, Paul, was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with all those who happened to be there. 
a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, ah, let the skipping begin. Because we have no Epicurean nor Stoics among us today in the 21st century, do we? We shall soon find out. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. All right, so first cause that's going to work together towards a sufficient cause that is necessary is that Paul has understanding. Understanding about any situation really comes from thinking about it. It is knowledge, and I just told you that knowledge is a good. Paul knew that, <coughs> and so there are things that he understood as he's stepping into this world. Um, first of all, Paul understood that at their core, every person on the planet is religious. And he knows, stepping into a context like Athens, Athens is an extremely religious place. Now, does it say anywhere um, in verse 17, so Paul reasoned in the synagogue. So what kind of people hang out in synagogues? Jewish people. Are there synagogues all over the ancient Near Eastern world? Yes. Yes, there are branches of the temple called synagogues all over the ancient Near Eastern world. So Judaism has spread. And then which church does he go visit? There isn't one. Right? He does not go to First Baptist Church of Athens because it does not exist. He goes to no church. So he talks to the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, and then he goes to the marketplace. We'll get to that in a second. So because there is no church in Athens, does that then mean for us that, that Athens is a religious or irreligious place? Can we make any determination because there is no church there? By the way, I'm expecting you to answer me when I ask you questions. This is not rhetorical. If you're not used to that, I'm sorry, but that's what we're going to do. It is an extremely religious place, At the, and it has been for generations. Um, from Homer's day, which we're not even sure when that is, but we do know that the first copies of Homer's Iliad started showing up around 750 B.C., so 750 years and then some before this time. We know that that book was showing up in the Greek world um, and describes an extremely religious place. And Paul knows that at the core, everybody's religious. I tell my students this in the classroom. Um, there are two days that I love in my classroom, particularly of any class, they are the first day and last day. Um, because I love the bookends, and I love setting the table on that first day. And I teach, I teach classes that are, by and large, um, required classes. I've only taught one upper-level class. It's like a Christmas miracle that they let a, a guy like me teach that stuff. <laughs> it's only happened once. So I have kids that are taking Introduction to Philosophy and Ethics, and a lot of them aren't sure why in the world this is necessary, or perhaps maybe it's just because the Jesuits hate them. And, and they have to do it just because they're mean. So this is the academic equivalent of getting racked across the knuckles with, with a ruler. Um, because they've been conditioned, like so many of us have, that they're just there to learn how to do something. And, and they, stop, they don't stop and consider, wait a minute, this is an actual liberal arts university. That means we're going to teach you things outside of your discipline that's actually going to give your discipline meaning. That's how that works. But I love, I love setting the table because my students, some of them are interested because they're just curious, um, and, and others are like, this is going to be stupid. And I'll tell them, no, you need to give me an opportunity to, to try to convince you that you're not only going to not hate this, but you may actually like it. I love it. This is my youth knuckle-dragging youth pastor gene inside of me that's very, very strong. And so I love that. And, and so we start setting the table on those first days. And if we have time, by the way, what time do I need to be done, Pastor? Don't know. Very dangerous. Okay, so um, seriously, though. Yikes. Okay, so... Um, uh, so I, I share some things with them, like I share with them on that first day that, that I served as a Baptist pastor. That's for shock value. The looks on their faces is hysterical. Um, I get to share with them that I am a Christian, and I share with them some things about my family and stuff. 
Um, and I also let them know, and I said, so some of you in this room, as I tell you I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, I tell my students, some of you are relieved. And some of them are, because they, they realize they have at least one person in their academic lives who's not going to try to deconvert them. Um, in fact, what I can't tell them is I'm there for the complete opposite. I have to be very careful with how I communicate those things. Um, and I say, but there might be some of you in this room that are immediately tensed up because you might think, well, he's one of those that's a believer. And I let my students know, and I'm going to tell you this morning, every person on the planet not only is religious, every person on the planet is a believer. Every person on the planet believes something. In fact, if that's not bold enough for you, I'm going to press my luck and take it a step further. There will come a day, ladies and gentlemen, where the stalls and cells of hell will be populated with believers. Now, could I make the words Christian and believer synonymous? Of course I could. Is there anything wrong with that? No, I'm clearly not doing that now. All Christians believe, but not all believers are Christians. Did you follow that? Let me say it one more time. All Christians believe, but certainly not all believers are Christians. Paul understood at the core, every person on the planet is religious. It's an extremely religious place. Not only that, it does go backwards. I thought it didn't go backwards. That's weird. Okay, so Paul is distressed by the idolatry that he sees in the city. So you see that right there in Acts chapter 16. This adds to his understanding. Um, while Paul is waiting in Athens, he's greatly distressed to see that the city is full of idols. And so you'll notice Luke, and in, in, even though the New Testament is written kind of, um, kind of country person, um, lay Greek, it's still a very rich language. And these guys that God used to write scripture, they have a lot of words at their disposal. Luke could have said Paul was ticked off, he was angry, it made him sick, but he chose instead this word distressed. As Paul looks at the idols, it's the very same word used of Jesus, um, used by Matthew as he describes Jesus moving through the towns and villages teaching the good news of the kingdom of God, and he's greatly distressed to see that the people are helpless, leaderless, and like sheep without a shepherd. It is the word that I would use to describe to you um, the feeling I got as I pastored in Scranton, and uh, I, I did my share of weddings and funerals when I was in Scranton. I did way more funerals than I ever did weddings, and most of the funerals I did were for people quite a bit younger than me, and I left the official pastorate at 42 years of age. Most of the funerals I did were for people younger than me who died horribly. We had two murder victims out of our youth group in that church, overdoses, suicides, um, preventable diseases, 34-year-olds ought not be di dying from cirrhosis of the liver, like all kinds of stuff. And so my phone would ring at 2 o'clock in the morning. And living in the age of technology, um, unlike the dark ages, I don't have to pick up the phone and say hello to find out who's calling me. I can just look at the phone. And usually I knew these situations were coming, but when someone calls you, you're calls their pastor at 2 o'clock in the morning, you look at your phone, my heart just sinks into my stomach. That's what that word means. I'm not mad. I'm not angry. I'm not cheesed off that they woke me up. I feel terribly for them. And Paul's distressed at the idolatry, and not only that, he knew the thought culture of his world. He knew the thought culture of his world. Now, we're going to spend some time, basically the, the time I have left, talking about this. Paul is from one of three intellectual center, centers in the ancient world. So there's his hometown of Tarsus, where he's from. There's Alexandria, Egypt. And there's Athens. Now, if you're thinking, well, what about Rome? Is that an academic center? No, Rome is like the Johns Hopkins of the ancient world. It comes online much later than everyone else. Um, so those three are the places of ancient learning. Paul would have been classically trained. He's prepared for what is about to happen with these Epicureans and Stoics. 
Now, it tells us that the Epicureans and Stoics, I'm going to skip down a little bit, um, have a problem with what Paul is saying. Luke tells us that he is preaching the good news of the resurrection, and he is doing so in the marketplace. That is the Greek word agora. The closest equivalent, equivalent we have to that in our day is Walmart. You, you all have Walmart here in, in Merton, Wisconsin? <coughs> okay. Um, one of the most significant Walmart experiences I ever had was not too far away in Deer Park. Is that the name of the town? Just west of here? Or east of here? Deer. Deer. No. Definitely not Delafield. Deer something. Just north of Milwaukee. Brown Deer. That was an exciting Walmart experience. We'll have to talk about time. Anyway. Um, so the Agora is the Walmart of the day. And just like today, I don't care who you are, how bougie you think you are, eventually you're going to need to go to Walmart or Meyer if you're from Michigan or whatever. You're going to have to go to some. And isn't it kind of glorious just to admit that there is a place where you can buy a shirt, a battery for your car, and go to Subway all under the same roof? Is, that not, is there not something really glorious about that? So in Paul's day, you know, he's getting a camel blanket a new toga and going to gyro way I suppose and please don't please don't lecture me on how to pronounce gyro I've studied Greek and it really makes no sense I, I don't get it Th that's all I need to say about that um, so that's where he is and he's explaining the good news of the resurrection and it says that these two groups say what what is this babbler trying to say in fact they say did you notice where he said they said he seems to be advocating foreign gods did you catch that Anybody have to take an intro to philosophy class? You may have heard that phrase before. That's not the first time that's been said in Athens. He, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. 400 years prior to this, and then some, in 399 B.C., a pug-nosed, short, rather ugly philosopher was sentenced to death by jury of his peers. His name was Socrates. Socrates... Um, asked a question. His question was, what holds everything together? What, what's at the center of all things? Why is there order instead of disorder? Or if I want to use the fancy Greek words, why is there cosmos instead of chaos? Why don't we all just go spinning off the planet? Something has to hold it all together. So he stepped back to philosophically contemplate that question, and he said, for generations for centuries we Greeks have always said it is the gods plural that hold everything together and Socrates said I can tell you pretty certainly it can't possibly be the gods because I've read our books I've read Homer I've read the Iliad and in the Iliad the gods change their minds constantly they don't get along and they don't tell us what they want and that's the very mild version of explaining the Greek gods to you and so Socrates said, it can't possibly be them. So who is it? And Socrates said, you know what? I actually think it is one God that holds it all together. And he had a word for it. You know what he called it? The Logos. And those of you who have some understanding of the Gospel of John, you're like, wait a minute. Is that the same word that John uses in the beginning was the word? Yep. 400 years later, John writing to a Greek audience, hey Greeks, that thing you've always been looking for? I know who it is. It's not a what, it's a who. Oh, and by the way, the logos, the center of all things that holds everything together, that's also described that way in Colossians, the center of all, that holds everything together became one of us. Socrates never would have dreamed of that. Became one of us. Um, and that actually was the thing that got him killed. He was accused of corrupting the youth. I really like that idea. By the way, in the name of Jesus, I intend to corrupt the youth. Just so you know. So he understood um, all these things, and he understood the thought culture of his world. Now, it says a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers have a problem with him. And so this is, this is like one of those things, if it, it, you're not told in the text because original readers of Acts would have known this, 
without it having been taught to them because Epicureans and Stoics were kind of a big deal in their day. But the reason they, they have a problem is not because they don't like Jesus. It's not because they dislike the church. It's none of those things. It's because neither Epicureans nor Stoics have any concept of a resurrection. They have no concept of a resurrection. That's why they think this is a little bit nuts, what they're hearing about. Now, we hear words like Epicurean and Stoic, and we think dead old curtain wearers who are moldering in their tombs. They have nothing to do with us. Well, in some ways that's right, but they are still around. Now, that curtain wearer up there is actually a picture of um, Epicurus, founder of Epicureanism. Um, he was alive about 300 years before the time of Christ, a Roman. And these are the guys that actually said um, what they're looking for is for a life free of pain. Oh no, that sounds very heathen. <clears throat> well, is there anything God, wrong with asking God to give you a pain-free existence? No. And looking around this room, it would not surprise me if someone in this room prayed this morning, God, please give me some moments today that are pain-free. Okay. But they actually made pain, pain, a life free of pain <clears throat> and a life that maximizes pleasure as the good. So if Epicureans had t-shirts made, it would say things like, if it feels good, do it. Party like you're, it's 1999. I don't know what that would mean to them, but still they could get it done anyway. Or YOLO, any of those things would be printed on an Epicurean t-shirt. Um, they're the ones that um, a, a later Stoic, Seneca, would say, these are the guys that... that eat to vomit and vomit to eat. So if in your mind when you hear Epicurean you get that Roman image of a bunch of party animals standing around, toga, 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 that's what they turned into. Now that's not what they started off as 300 years before the time of Christ. By the time you get to Paul's day, that is indeed what they are. And they were the ones that really were the closest thing to atheists in the ancient world. They believed all things were made up of matter. They were atomists. The word atom is actually a Greek word, and shockingly, it means very, very tiny particle. So they were actually called atomists. They believed all things were made up of particles, including you. And if the gods existed at all, you always kind of had to air, quote, and wink when you talked about the gods. They're just like us, and they don't care about us, so it doesn't matter. Live your life. Seek pleasure. Do what you want. If it feels good, do it. Eat, drink, and be moral be merry for tomorrow we die surely there's no one in the 21st century that thinks like that today like this young lady that's Miley Cyrus that's among the more appropriate pictures I could show you on a Sunday morning oh yeah they're very much uh, among us today and my students um, when given the opportunity will defend the worldview of Epicureanism because it is based in pleasure now Stoicism. Now that, that guy, that's a, a bust, a, a picture of a bust of Marcus Aurelius, second century Roman emperor. Um, you could go to your local big box bookstore and find his writings all packaged nicely um, in a book called Meditations because there is this whole renaissance with Stoicism because it's about being in control, being in balance. Um, and basically, if, if they had a life that maximized virtue, so sometimes it's compared to Christianity, um, and they, they were not atheists, they believed in this great mind, but this mind thing that they believed in was reason itself and not a personal God. And for them, um, for them, if you asked uh, a Stoic, what, what is salvation, they, they wouldn't know what that word means, but they believed that <coughs> every so many eons, every so many thousand generations, there should be this great kind of cleansing fire that's going to come through and do a great reset. Any Marvel Cinematic Universe fans in the room? That's Thanos. He's a stoic. That's what he wants. Left hand, the snap. It's going to reset everything. You, you find that motif in science fiction over and over and over again. Um, they, they too did not have any concept of an afterlife. And, and Paul knew those. And if you're wondering, boy, do we have any stoics among us today? Yep, probably like that guy. Um, that's probably a really good example of a Stoic. Um, if I dared, I would also put on the screen a, a picture of Mr. Spock at the same time, but I don't think I have the power to put Star Trek and Star Wars on the same screen. 
without the universe unraveling. So I'm not going to do that. If you're a sci-fi fan, you're welcome for that joke. So these are the things that, that Paul understands. And then he knows what world he's speaking into, so then he takes opportunity. And beginning in verse 19, and we're going to wrap this up really quickly. In verse 19, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just saying. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. This is bold. This is now taking opportunity. He has understanding, so now he's going to turn this understanding into opportunity. And he stands up, and notice he does not say, hey, I'm religious, you're religious, what's true for me is not necessarily true for you, which is a complete nonsense statement, by the way. Truth is truth, whether you believe it or not, it's still true. Two plus two is four, whether or not you can count past one. Did you know that? It's called an objective truth claim. So Paul doesn't stand there and say, well, hey, we all have those things that we believe in. That's cool. Peace out. I'm just going to wait for my... No, he's like, look, I've gone around and looked carefully at the things that you worship. I do this when I visit universities. I go to their objects of worship. It's the student union building. I look at their posters. I look at the things that they're celebrating. I go to their bookstores, and I look at the stacks beyond the t-shirts and hats and kitsch, because I don't need any more of that. And I go look at the philosophy, literature, religion, and history sections, and I want to see what are these students reading. And usually I will find the same book on all those sections, depending on what year it is and what the hottest idea is, and grant you some kind of Marxist presented thing every time. And I want to figure out what they're worshiping so that I can speak into them so I know. And Paul does that, and he said, I see, Athenians, that you are so religious, and I wish I had time to give you the religious history of Athens and why it is such a religious place, but you have monuments to gods everywhere. In fact, you have a monument to an unknown god just to cover your bases. Some translations say, have Paul saying, what you have worshipped in ignorance today I will declare to you. And then he speaks with authority. Beginning in verse 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 24, and what he gives is a master's class in using natural revelation to bring, bring about a co communication of the resurrection. This is brilliant. And by natural revelation, that means using what God has revealed about himself in the natural world to speak about who he is. Now, in Bible college, I was taught that was a thing, but not a very important thing. Guess what passage we never studied? Acts chapter 17. It is really important. Or how about Psalm 19? The heavens declare the glory of God. That is an actual declaration of natural revelation. Or Romans 1. What can be known about God can be clearly seen from what has been made so that men are without excuse. This is what he does. He goes on to explain. I'm going to give you the short Giesman translation right now. So he says, okay, here's the difference. Your gods need you to build them houses, barns, sheds, and bring them food and, and take care of them. The God I serve does not need me. He actually likes me, Paul could have added. Your gods don't even like you, which is true. It's terrible. I'm, I'm serious. You could read Homer's Iliad to get a picture of the things that they believed. Their gods were horrible. Eh, we may let you die today. Is there anything I can do to change your mind? Not really. I'm just a jerk. That's basically, that's Ro uh, uh, Greek mythology in a nutshell. And so Paul says, they don't need me. He doesn't need me. I need him. And unlike your gods, and it's, it, it, it's so clear in the text, if someone had an understanding of Greek religion, he said, the God, singular, of heaven 
and earth. He's the God of both because you see the Greeks and the Romans believe that there are gods above the earth and under the earth. They're gods of this world and the underworld. And Paul said, no, there's, there's one God. And by the way, it is this God who made all things, speaking them into existence. The other gods, if you read their creation myths, they always have something to work with. They have a kit. God spoke everything into existence, and he did that so he could set the times and places for all men to live so that some would seek him and find him, because he's not far off, as your own poets have said, and he quotes a couple of Greek rock stars. And then he goes on to say, and how do I know all this is true? Because he raised his son from the dead. And God has let you limp along in ignorance, but a time is coming. And Luke tells us at the end of that passage that there are several who give their lives to Jesus. There are some who jeer him and some who want to hear more. And we're actually told that there are two people by name, one of whom goes on to become the pastor of Athens, Dionysius, and a woman named Damaris. Now, sometimes I'll have people come up to me after I give this talk and say, well, you know why Paul failed in Athens, don't you? He failed. It's a pre-Christian world, and two people by name are told gave their lives to Jesus, not to mention the nameless ones that Luke mentions. Okay, so let me grant to you that he failed. How did he fail? And the answer will come back, well, because he used man's logic, not God's logic. And I just smile and I say, what's the difference? Logic is logic. Do you realize if there is no God, logic does not exist? What word do we get from the word logos? Logic. Now, can you use logic badly? Yes. Well, I have a dozen donuts. I'm going to eat half. And then you come back later, I only have half a dozen donuts. I'm going to eat them. That, friends, is bad logic. Now, does it work? Yes. But that's still bad logic. Um, And Paul reasons with them and that word reason that you see right at the beginning of Acts the passage in Acts 17 you find that all throughout Paul's missionary journeys beginning in Acts chapter 9 at his conversion I did a deep dive on these things it's really pretty amazing and so he combines um, the understanding and opportunity and then speaks with authority and we see uh, a, a place that has no church There are no Christians there. By name, we know two names, and Luke says that there are others. Um, I face situations like that regularly at the university. Um, Had I spoken here eight years ago when we first started, my understanding of what is happening in our universities would be far different than it is today. Things are happening at a rate that I, I was unprepared for. Um, I, I'm shocked at the, the speed increase of the downward spiral that we are seeing. And this is not coming from some crotchety old fundamentalist that just thinks that there's nothing good at the university. I believe in the university system. It's, I think it's a good thing. But it is dark. And uh, I, I would cover your prayers and any help that you could give us and holding back an entire generation. So, as I wrap up here, thank you for giving me a few extra minutes, Pastor. As I wrap up here, I, I want to leave you with a benediction. It's, it's a non-traditional benediction. Um, so, a benediction, of course, comes from the Latin benedictus, which means to drop the mic. You didn't, you didn't know that, did you? Um, And the benediction that I want to give you is a hybrid of a famous speech given before a great battle. Um, It is in the movie form of the story and not the book. So I'm just going to tell you that. And if you know, you know. And if not, that's okay. There may come a day when the church is called to abandon the university. Abandon it to itself, to its idolatry, into its godlessness, but that is not this day. God bless you.
please stand with us as we close our service with a, an appropriate song for this morning. confess that uh, in, uh, in the Sunday school hour I, I was uh, moved <laughs> but uh, not necessarily uh, I, I'm not sure what to think it was disturbing actually to me uh, how rapidly the colleges are destroying our young people it is just amazing I just want to make uh, one quick announcement uh, and that is to uh, remind you that next week is the fifth Sunday and we will be discussing those questions that have been submitted so far. It will be kind of a roundtable discussion and uh, we invite you to come and hear what we have to say about those questions. So let us pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, once again, we just thank you for this time of worship and uh, Lord, the message that we heard from um, Andy and, and uh Reminded once again, Lord, that uh, this is a dark world. Um, worshippers are all around us, but what 
and who do they worship? And uh, Lord, we are familiar with many that do actually worship science. Uh, the God of science is now taking the front seat in many people's lives and and it's no God at all. So Lord, help us to recognize that, help us to engage. Give us courage, Lord, to stand. And I wanna pray especially for Andy, Lord, as he's working in universities where he's surrounded by those philosophies and uh, the work that he's doing. I ask that you protect him. I ask not only protect him physically, but more importantly, spiritually. Um, protect him in a sense that uh, he would not be exposed for what he knows, what the colleges are trying to do. I, I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, be with him and especially for his family. So thank you once again for this time together. Uh, we praise you and thank you for the things that you do and how you hold back darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we are dismissed.